Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the way Paul begins this chapter, Romans 5. And he has spent the last four chapters trying to help us see that we are all sinners. We've all transgressed the law of God and even sinned against our own conscience. And then last chapter and four, he discussed the idea it's through faith. It's not through keeping of the law because we have not kept the law. We're lawbreakers. We are found guilty. And so it's through faith that we trust in God for a free gift that he's going to give us. And so he's going to expound on that now in Romans chapter 5. So maybe to help us get started, we're going to, if you want to turn there in your Bible, we'll read it through the chapter so we can get the context and then uh, we'll be able to discuss it. So Romans chapter 5, Mark can begin reading there in verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, God died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought common condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man Jesus Christ. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So now we're going to uh, sing a song. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. And then following that, uh, we'll have uh, the prayer. Thank you, Lord.
Father, thank you for saving our souls. Thank you, Father, for the gift that we've received, the gift of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sin. Thank you, Father, that we're able to uh, join together in song and praise you. And thank you for the ability to talk to you through prayer. And thank you for speaking to us through your word, through the scriptures, through the Bible. Father, help us to learn and learn and learn until we can. We just fill ourselves up with your word, Father, so that we can uh, live a life of peace. And we pray that uh, we'll get that peace as we read through today. In the name of Jesus, amen. So Romans 5 begins with uh, this idea. Let's read verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through keeping the law perfectly, we have peace with God, and we have also gained access into grace by which we... It doesn't say that, does it? Now, if... We had kept the law perfectly. We could do that. And that's kind of the case that Paul is continually trying to build here. And for us in the Bible class, maybe you feel it's a little repetitious. I feel it's repetitious. Sometimes we're saying the same things over and over again. But Paul is just continually building this case so that no one can say, oh, no, I'm saved by keeping the old law, keeping the Ten Commandments and, uh, you know, still trying to do it all myself. I don't need salvation or forgiveness or savior i can do this on my own and he's saying no it's not on our own it's not what we're doing it's because of a justification process you'd have to say you're better than abraham that you're better than david and you're better than any other biblical person Uh, and you can't say that you can't ever say that Uh, we don't have that uh, we have to have that faith we have to be the the justification has to come through christ right And, and what what is a justification you know, justification is a, you know a declaration of innocence. I think, isn't it? It's what you know. God is justified. He's cleansed us. He's uh, He's made us right. Right. Yep. Yeah. I I know some people define the word just by breaking it up. So it's just as if I'd justified. Yeah. Just as if I'd never sinned. That's what it is. So it's it's yeah. It's all been erased. So I, I've been charged with a crime, which is called sin, sinning against God. And we do that in many different ways. And again, we've talked about that over the past weeks of Bible study. But So I've sinned, I've broken the law, and there's a penalty to be paid. And that Jesus now has come, paid the price. Again, God could not just say, I'll erase, I'll just look over, I will just pretend it never happened. God can't do that because he is just. So in order, for him to be just, that penalty has to be paid. But I am justified, which means all of that has been taken away. All those charges have been dismissed because Jesus paid the penalty. Mm-hmm. He, he has taken my place and suffered on my behalf so that I could be set free. So mm-hmm. I've, I've been justified through Christ. And back to that chapter, uh, verse 2, through whom we have gained access gain access to God, gain access to that forgiveness through or by faith into His grace. We are in His grace in which we now stand. You and I are in His grace right now because we have been justified. Our sin has been erased and you and I stand in that grace. And and that's just a beautiful statement. Look where we're at, look where we're at, Peter. Right. In spite of who we are and what we've done, we have God who has just, you know, Jesus has justified us and we now stand in His grace. Right. Wow. And it's not based on anything that we've done. It's no. based on what He has done. And, and that's why we, why we can all come to be united together because we're all in the same boat. We have all sinned and we all are in need of a Savior and we've all received grace. We've all received this free gift that we have. And so He talks here that we have peace with God and we have hope. So, you know, you think about people in, their, in, in life today, what do they really need? Really, they need peace. I mean, who does not leave, need peace in their life? I mean, we have all kinds of things that bring turmoil, even in our own head, uh, with circumstances going on around us. I mean, you don't even have to watch the news to get a lot of turmoil. That helps to get turmoil and to get a lot of, you know, concern and fear and all that stuff. We have, don't have peace because of things happening in the world. Sometimes we'd have peace, just things happen in my own family, my own house, in my own mind, in my own heart. You know, there's yeah. just no peace. I'm glad we're studying this today because you know, today, this morning, I didn't have peace. Right. I had turmoil. Okay. And the agitations and the, you know, the things of the world were working on me. So now we're, we're looking at this and I, I, I'm standing in His grace. 
Right. I'm standing in His grace, and I have peace through God through Christ. Right. We have peace. Yeah. So a lesson for me today, and that was right. very it, nice of you, Peter, it to, even to line that up to yeah. be, you know, on a bad day for me. That you know, now we're studying something that can transition me to a better place, because I can read this and I can know where I stand, and then the turmoil is is lessened. It's right. uh, it's still out there, but it the effect it has on me could be much much different now. Right. Great place to be. Uh, the peace. Oh, well, I was reading from a commentator, Jim McGuigan. So he's got a, this is just a commentary book on the book of Romans. And this is what he says about this idea of peace and then also hope of looking forward to the future. This is what he says. Uh, Who has such hope? Not the unbeliever, not the man or the woman depending on moral performance, not the lounging, slumbering, indolent, or the presumptuous, the one who thinks I've got it made in the shade, No, it's the one who by faith stands in grace. That living and abiding faith lays hold on the access produced by grace and looks forward to the return of the Lord and the glory which will be revealed to the children of God at that time. This hope of ours comes through grace, 2 Thessalonians 2.16. It is a living hope, 1 Peter 1 verse 3 because it's based on the ever-living Christ and is mediated to us through his ever-living word, 1 Peter 1, verse 23 to 25. It is a sure and steadfast hope, Hebrews 9 and verse 16. It's a better hope, Hebrews 7 and verse 19, which looks trouble right in the eye and overcomes them, Romans 4, 18. It isn't escapism. Christians enjoy their life. Life here is a part of the will of their gracious Lord, but is more life ahead, and so they live in hope. It is their faith in the risen Lord that gives substance to their hope, Hebrews 11, verse 1, so that it is not a vain delusion. This is no whistling in the dark. Because of the resurrection of their Lord, they look confidently for a glorious resurrection, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13. The saint hopes for eternal life, Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, and through faith he now enjoys it, 1 John 5 and verse 13. So there's a lot of this idea of the hope that we have in God, the trust, which has got to do with the future, but the future sustains us now. The future can carry us through the dark days, the troubling times, the times of fear and, and depression and anger and worry. And so we've got something better in the future that carries us through the times where, yeah, it's a struggle. In the last part of chapter, uh, verse two in uh, chapter five, it says, and we boast in that hope. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Uh, if, if you can even imagine what, what that means, glory in our sufferings, because we know that that suffering produces perseverance. It makes us push ahead. It makes us continue on, uh, because we know that the suffering produces perseverance, and pers- perseverance produces character in us, and a character produces the hope. Right. So they all tie together. You know, the, the troubles you know, go to the, you know, the sufferings go to the uh, perseverance, to the character, to the hope. You know, so we have strength and power in Christ because of our hope and because we can rely on that hope we can boast in that hope uh, right. you know that i'm strong in the lord right and so two people that come to mind when i read that section about going through struggles and trials and persecution and difficulties and how is that building in my life so the verse helps us to understand that well one person that comes to mind would be abraham Oh, we've talked about him, haven't we? Yeah, somewhere before. And I think maybe that's what he has in mind. I mean, we just he just finished writing about Abraham in the previous chapter. But think about, you know, what he went through, that he went through suffering. But then what did he have? He had perseverance. He didn't give up. He kept looking forward. And that produced character. That made him stronger. That made him more faithful and more trusting in God. And that gave him more hope because God is faithful. The other person that you can think of, and there's a lot of people, but well, the other person would be David, who he also mentioned in the previous chapter. And maybe he's got that in mind when he's writing these things to say, who could we really look back on? But even before David became king, God said to David, 
Samuel anointed David king. So David knew I'm going to be the next king, but Saul's still alive. He can't be king till Saul dies. And now Saul's trying to kill him and he's pursuing him, right, to kill him. But David continues to trust in God, to hope in God. And so through that, he had sufferings, produced perseverance. Perseverance produced character, made him a better person. Probably when he became king, he was a better king than what he would have been if he didn't go through these trials and difficulties. But through that challenge, he continually had hope. Why? How could he have hope? He developed his strength and power you know, right. be, because of that reliance and then the outcome. Right. And again, throughout our life, we're challenged and we see the outcome. Then we're challenged again and we see the outcome. And that develops the strength and the character and the hope because we, we've already proven it. Right. We, we had the hope before and, and God followed through as he always does. Uh, we've seen the outcome of uh, a disaster in our life maybe or something that, uh, that we didn't look finally back on as a good memory. But God, somehow, he always, uh, he always comes through for us, right? right? So we get this uh, strength and power. In verse 5, it's not on the screen, but it, it says, hope does not put us to shame or doesn't disappoint us. Right. You know, we, we have that hope and we're not disappointed. We might not understand everything that happens, but hey, we got to be good with it. We roll with it. We stay with it. Uh, we continue to have that, that hope in, in, uh, in boasting that glory of God. So what do we hope in? Well, we hope in the promise of God, what God has said. So again, think of David. You're trying to interview David um, before he's king. He's running from Saul. David, are you afraid that of your life? Are you afraid you're going to die? Maybe. Well, but, but he but, would say, God said, I'm going to become king. Yeah. I'm not dying before I become king because God said I would be anointed right. king. Now, so would he have afraid... some fear at times or he'd be a little bit, right. you, know, un, yeah. you know, shaken maybe right. at times? And did he have some responsibility? Well, he was running and fleeing for his life, probably yeah. thinking this is what God wants me to do. He doesn't want me to <laughs> stay here there and, be slaughtered, and, right? yeah, and, and dodge spears yeah. all day long. But so he, he took the appropriate action, but he, I don't think he was afraid. He just believed God... God said had I'd a be promise. king, and I'm going to be king. And he's and, shown that over and over again, hasn't he? And that's the same thing with Abraham, though, right? Yeah. Abraham, do you think you're going to have a baby? Well, yeah, maybe one day. And it's like, well, you're 40 now. You're getting kind of old, aren't you? Well, 60, 80, Abraham, do you think you're going to have a baby? I know I'm going to have a baby because God said I was going to have a baby. And that, that's kind of, you know, we think about when Abraham sometimes questioned, you know, like, okay, well, you know, if we go in, like we mentioned last time, he went into two cities and he was afraid that, if the, the, the king thought uh, Sarah was very beautiful and wanted to take her as his wife, and he and Sarah were married, that God would, sorry, that, that the king would kill Abraham. But, but what should have Abraham have thought? God made a promise that I'm not going to die until she has a baby. She's not pregnant yet. So I'm going to so live a little longer. I'm huh? going to live. Yeah. I can do whatever I want. This king cannot kill me. Because yeah. God had made a promise. Now, he was weak in his faith yeah, at that he, point. He wavered, and we all so, wavered. Yeah. So, but but that's, what, that's what the promise is. So what we do is we look at the promise of God, what God has said. It's like, for instance, God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that's a promise we can hold on to, that he is always going to be with us. Now, God did not say life is always going to be easy. It's always going to be fun. It's going to work out all the time as you see it. There's never going to be any suffering and any persecution. Well, actually, God said quite the opposite in almost all those things, that we are going to suffer, we're going to have persecution, There's going to be we're going trials. to have trials, Absolutely. Satan's going to keep after us. So we're going to have to go through that. But what we can trust in, the promises of God, that he's always going to be with us. He'll strengthen us. He'll help us through the temptation. He'll give us what we need so we can have victory. And he's promised us eternal life. He, he's not going to abandon those promises he's made. So we yeah. can trust in God. That's what's going to carry us through. In, in verse 6, it talks about, uh, you know, it says, you see at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That would be us. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love. And then again, that, you know, we, we're not disappointed. Uh, he demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, he died for us. Christ died for us when we were still sinners, when we were lost, when we were separated from God. That's what he did for us. So you know, he's done that. We can trust whatever else he says. Right. We can have faith in his promises because of that. Right, and we can be assured of his love. Because you think about when I was, like let's just say, when I was at my worst, God loved me. When I was at my worst, Christ died for me. Now, I'm not at my 
best yet, right? right. Still working on that. <laughs> but I'm better than what I was, right? I'm growing. I'm, I'm becoming a little bit more righteous. It's maybe a slow journey, but I'm trying to be more righteous. I'm trying to be more faithful. I'm trying to love God more, be more thankful and worship Him. So I'm growing. So if Christ, or if God through Christ loved me way back there, yeah. I, He's not giving up loving me, you know, because... You know, I, I, I still don't deserve his love or his grace, but, but boy, he is patient and kind, and he's full of grace. He's still working on us. So. Still working, but I don't need to give up on him because I know he's not giving up on me. So it gives us hope as we continue to, to grow in our faith. And certainly at this point, we don't say, well, I think I'm going to go back and I'm going to try to earn God's love based on, you know, my performance, based yeah. on, you know, not how gonna, well I Not going to ever happen. Right. It's not going to happen, but no. sometimes people still try to do that. Like, I know with the Galatian, when Paul wrote Galatians, he said to people, you've been saved by the grace of God, and now you're trying to live according to your own deeds, according to the flesh? No, we still rely on the grace of God. We don't go back to the law and There's say, no second answer, is there? There's yeah. always the same answer. Right. We're saved by grace through Christ, through faith in Christ. Nothing different. We can try to make it different. It's never going to be different. Right. But it certainly changes us. It makes us into a new people because we know God's love and grace motivates us. And yeah. so that's a big change. You know, we think about life maybe growing up uh, in, in our home when we were little or maybe even our own children or grandchildren when they're little. You know, they can respond based on law. So if you do this, you will be punished in this way. You know, you will not be able to play on your device and you'll have to go to your room or just whatever the punishment would be. Well, you don't want your children always to be responding to you as a parent for fear of punishment. You'd hope that maybe they would respond by love. They say, you know, my parents are kind and they're loving me and they, they, they give me all kinds of things. And they're so, so when my parent says, you know, hey, can you go clean your room? Please go clean your room. You say, well, well, I'm willing to do that. I, I'm thankful for my parents. I, I love, love my and parents. respect and, yeah, and honor. A, and after all they do for me, I mean, mom cleans the house and she does the dishes and she, you know, and dad's out working and he takes care of the yard and he helps mom do the dishes and, you know, whatever it would be, however those chores. But they do a lot. So why can't I respond based on their kindness or goodness yeah. or grace? And, you know, so uh, hopefully a child will. And that's the same thing with us and God. We don't say, well, I got to follow the rules. I keep following the rules, you know. Um, if, you, if you live that way, even as a Christian, um, so you're basically an immature Christian. You're a childish Christian that you have to be motivated. By the way, if you don't straighten this out, you know, you've got the fear of hell hanging over you. If you're thinking There's about no that. There's no joy. You better all... live in, yeah. with a little bit of joy in your Christianity because right. you know, those are people that uh, outsiders don't want to be. They don't want to be right. a Christian who is hopelessly uh, lost in that uh, fear. Right. You know, if we don't have to show joy in our life and show, show joy in our life with Christ, nobody's going to be part of it. Right. So we are motivated because of God's love. And God, yeah. He was willing to give everything for us. In Romans 5 and verse 10, uh, For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, Shall we be saved through his life? And so he's kind of bringing in here um, kind of a new concept. There's not only the death of Christ, which saves us. He paid the penalty for our sin on the cross. And now he lives. Now we've got the resurrection, mm -hmm. a whole new power. The power of God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That Jesus... Now there were other people that were raised from the dead. Even the Old Testament, there was a few raised from the dead. New Testament... Both Jesus and the apostles raised people from the dead. But you want to know something? Those people, they died again. You know, it's, it's one thing to be raised from the dead to die again. But Jesus is risen from the dead to live forever. To reign forever. Yeah. Right? And Hebrews says he's living so that he can intercede on our behalf. He's there before God, you know, as our intercessor. So he, he was raised from the dead to show the power of God. He, he said to the apostles, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. I'm going to raise from the dead. I'm going to go to heaven so that where I am, there you can be also. So there's a lot of the promises in the resurrection. So God loves us that much, died for our sins, and now Jesus has been raised. Then he's going to go on, in a couple chapters still yet, 
But through the power of the resurrection, through this, this power, that can be the power in our lives as well. The power of Christ, the resurrected Christ to live in us, to change us. It's available us. to us now, isn't it? Right. Yeah, yeah. chapter 6, we'll get there. Uh, getting into the next part, you know, death through Adam and life through Christ. You know, the sin came from Adam. Uh, verse 12 talks about the sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And this way, death came to all people. But you know, verse 13 shows some hope. You know, to be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. So, you know, sin's not been charged against me because of Christ. Right. It should have been. But it wasn't. All right. So we've been set free from at least feeling like we have to um, make sure that we follow all the law. Because again, we can't. Even as a Christian, we still sin. We are still tempted. We still break the law, the covenant, the standard, even the morals of God that, that He has given, that the things that we, that we know are wrong. You know, sometimes maybe we, when we you know, maybe lie or when we gossip or when we neglect an opportunity to serve or, you know, there's all kinds of different ways we may sin. Now, we don't have to walk around with all the guilt and say, oh, no, I've sinned against. I am so unworthy. Well, you know, in a way, I am unworthy to go to heaven, but Jesus has made me worthy. So I'm not worthy on my own, but I don't have to, when I sin, to think, oh, no, you know, I guess I've lost my place in heaven. You know, I've lost my relationship. The, you know, the Bible says the blood of Christ continues to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. So that's when we're walking with Christ, when we're living for Him. The, the Bible realizes that we're going to continue to sin, but our goal is to walk in the light, to walk in a righteous way. But yeah. when we sin, we don't have to be fearful. Consequences of sin is death. So, you know, but we, we continue to be forgiven. And so, yes, the law no longer has that power in my life. To make me feel like uh, I'm, I'm condemned, right? I'm going to receive some kind of punishment because right. we walk in the light. As he is in the light, right? Yeah. So that's First John chapter one. Right. If we walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of right. Jesus Christ, His Son, continually continually cleanses, cleanses us right? absolutely from yeah. all unrighteousness. So we can be sure of our salvation. Uh, you know, and and sometimes people wonder. You know, you know, have I sinned too much, too often? Uh, have I have I wandered too far away? Have I been gone too long? Or wh whatever, you know, am, am I beyond the grace of you're God? You're never too far for, for God to reach out. You know? right. And you're never too far to reach back to God. God's always reaching to us. Right. It's just we've got to reach back. We're never too far away right. until we breathe our last. Right. So you, you better hurry. Yeah, you know, that's because right. Because we don't know when that's going to be. Never so we want to be in the right, right relationship with God as as we're walking in the light. And, we you know, we don't want to be... Playing the line, right? Uh, and you know we're going to continue to sin, but we need to, you know, continue to strive for live for God. But we don't want to be, you right. know, not facing the cross right. through our life. Now we talk about the death that came through Adam, and uh, verse fifteen talks about the gift. So we have we have death through Adam, and then in verse fifteen it says, "But the gift, which is life through Christ, is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one, that'd be Adam." How much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? So the many is not just Jews, it's Jews and Gentiles and all that call on the name of the Lord right. and all that live for Christ. So it goes to the many. It's just an incredible gift if we reach out and accept that gift. I mean, you can get the gift, but if someone doesn't accept that gift, then it's lost. Right. So he talks about two men here. So one man is Adam, who introduced sin into the world. Adam and Eve, when they took of the, the fruit in the garden of the forbidden tree. Disobeyed God. Disobeyed, yeah. rebellion, became prideful, wanted to become like God. You know, how they were tempted by the devil. Uh, so they brought sin into the world. And ever since them, you know, sin has been in the world. Uh, we have all been tempted and we've all, we've all sinned. So through their introduction of sin into the world, we've all sinned. We, we, we continue to you know, choose sin. And so now he's saying, just like, and so I think everybody knows sin is in the world. I don't think we have to look very far to, to see that as a reality. Just like sin is in the world and permeated throughout the world. So now there's another man that came, and, and sometimes the Bible calls him the second Adam, the second 
So Adam is, is kind of like the first man, the, the one man. And so Christ is also the first man, the one man, the first man to bring something else. He's not going to bring sin. Now he's going to bring the remedy for sin. He's going to bring the solution. He's going to bring life now. So Jesus is the one man who lived righteously and then died on our behalf so that, that we, through the one man, Jesus Christ. So we've all lived according to the one man, Adam, sinned. But now we're all invited to participate and to partake of the one man, Jesus Christ. Accept the gift. Accept the gift of salvation. Right. And so again, I think it's just reiterating here, like there's no of the keeping of the law. I think I'm redeemed because of the good things that I've done and I've done more good things than bad things. And by the way, I've done more good things than Mark's done good things. So I feel good about myself and I think I'm going to go to heaven based on my own actions, my own goodness. And he's continually saying that's not going to happen. And so we don't have to feel like we're a complete failure and there's no hope. And he's saying there is hope, but the hope is not based on our performance. Our hope is based on the performance of Jesus. Yeah. Of the verse 18 uh, mirrors verse 15 in many ways. Uh, it says, consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act, and that would be Jesus on the cross, resulted in justification and life for all people. So we have that reconciliation. We have that declared innocence uh, because of Christ, you know, doing that one righteous act and taking on the sins of the world and taking it to the cross. Right. And that's one thing that we can rejoice in, right? That's Absolutely. one thing. You, you know, and, and this is what Paul seems to be saying over and over again, that he realizes he's got a very powerful message and a, and a message that brings glory to God, right? So it's not, you know, making himself look good or promoting himself. He's simply promoting this message of God, which is salvation. And so it is definitely good news. And so he wants us all to remember this and to practice this and, and, and to rejoice in it, to rejoice mm -hmm. in this gift that we have. And, and think about what a change that would make in our life if we are being reminded in our, again, in our own minds to, to say, what has God done for me and through me and to me? How much does he love me? And that should, that should motivate me to say, well, I just want to serve him. I want to love him. And I, and I want to enjoy the relationship. And there's no longer the fear, the, you know, the fear of, well, what if I don't do right? Right? And there's no longer this thinking, well, how much do I need to do? And so, you know, maybe like the illustration of being married, you know, you know, a marriage relationship generally does not go very well. When I go to my wife and I say, I would just like to know what the bare minimum is. Like, what is, what is the least that I need to do to keep this marriage? I just want you to be happy, but I don't want to do too much. I don't want to make you too happy. So I'm just going to do the least that I need to do to make you happy. So let's just do the bare minimum, right? That, that, that doesn't sound much like a good relationship. Like, I just want to hold this thing together, like you're saying, by a thread. As opposed to saying, I mean, I just want to love my wife. I just want to please her. I want, I want her life to be complete. I want, I'm looking for opportunities to serve her. I, you know, I wouldn't think, well, maybe I've already done too much today. I don't need to do any more, you know. Yeah. I, I think I've, I've told her I love her enough in our relationship. I don't think I need to tell her I love her anymore. Or, you know, that I've helped her around the house already today. You know, she can do the rest all on her own. You know, I'm just looking for opportunities where I can serve and I can be a blessing. Why? Because of fear that she's going to leave me if I don't? Am I thinking in my mind all the time, I just go around the house all day long thinking, divorce, divorce, divorce. If I don't, if I don't act right, she's going to divorce. If I say the wrong thing, she's going to divorce. This that relationship's going to be over. You know, it's all going to end up bad. Or maybe worse, you know, if, if I do that one more time, she's going to hurt me yeah. or she's going to kill me. I mean, who wants to live in fear like that all the time as opposed to, I just want to love her. Yeah. You know, so it, it's there's a, no fear. Our anymore. relationship, you know, when we're in Christ and Christ is in us, then we have joy. We, right. we don't get joy otherwise. Right. You get this, you know, you get this relationship that's just all over the map. You, you're in him and he's in you. And that cements a relationship. Right. And as a side, I would never, ever introduce the word that, that begins with a D. Right. In my home. Right. Never introduce that word. Right. But how many people are motivated by that? Yeah, by the if you're fear even if you're, by you, that, you never yeah. say it. It's just like, well, if I don't do enough, if mm. I don't do enough, the relationship will be ended. And that's the problem here. Yeah. 
If, if I don't please God enough, he's just going to abandon me. He's going to desert me. He said, I've had enough. There's no more forgiveness. There's no more second chances. We are getting a divorce and it's over and you're that's, gone. That's wrong thinking, isn't it? Right, because God's not like that. He's not. And so what we say no. is, how can I please God? How can I honor God? How can I, how can I show my thanksgiving for all that God has done? How can I have the joy of the Lord in my life? Because that's, that's what I want. And so it's not yeah. based on law anymore. It's based on love. It's based on God loves me. Me and, and I him and him and me. You know, right. Just all coming together. Right. Some, just like the marriage relationship. Right. Coming together in love and you know, mutual respect and honor and all those things coming together. Right. And so that's, that's where the relationship with God is so powerful. Uh, so First John says, you know, we love him because he first loved us. And of course, this right here in Romans 5 tells us how much God loved us, that he sent his son even while we're still sinners. So God loves us. But when I see how much he loves me, it's like, oh, I just want to love him back. Why would I want to have a relationship with somebody who hates me? Like the devil hates me. So why am I going to go out and seek to please him and to honor him and to, you know, do things for the devil and to start listening to him and following his ways and thinking he's got good ideas? Why don't I love the person who loves me? And that's God. So that's our motivation. So I think this is what's helping Paul's case when we think about, are we just bound by the law? We're just going to keep the law. And boy, I hope I've kept enough of the law of God today. Mm. So he's happy. Yeah, we're bound by grace, aren't we? Right. Through our faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, verse 19, the end of it says, uh, through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. In verse 20, it says, the law was brought in so that trespass trespass might increase, but where sin increases, God's grace increases all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Right. What a way to end that. See, the whole statement yep. just kind of ties it all together. Look where we're at now. Right. We're in a yep. good place, Peter. Yep. Yeah, sometimes we, you know, we kind of look at the, the way and again, the chapters were not in there in the first century. So at some point, a man... But this is a great place to put a chapter break, right? Yep. This is a good place because he... It's a, it's a comma sum, for the next chapter. Sums but, it up. But this next up. week, right? Yeah, it is leading into something else. But uh, it's just a great way to end a thought. So if you're doing a Bible reading, you know, you stop here at the end of chapter 5. And maybe tomorrow you go into chapter 6. For us, it's next next week we'll, or we'll be in chapter 6. So, but w- w- what a great message that yeah. uh, we have been set free not only from the punishment of sin, but also from the power of sin. It doesn't have to reign and rule. It doesn't have to control my life anymore. Like how many people, when they're not Christians or before they're Christians, they just feel like, I just sin. I can't help it. I can't stop it. I've got no power. It's just sin dwells in me and it reigns. It's just the power of sin. I can't get out from underneath it. Yeah, don't give up your power. The power is in Christ and we can't give it up. Right. So what what a beautiful message for us as we think about uh, living in Christ, a new life. Amen. And it's, it's cert- again, it's just not found in the law. Where else would you want to be? Right. And so Paul helps us to see that really, as we're going to sing a song, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Well, it's not the law. It's not me being a better person. It's not seeking help from somebody else. It's, you know, what can wash away my sin? It's not talking to a friend or parent, a counselor, those people may be able to help us and lead us and guide us in some ways, but unless they're pointing us to Jesus, there's nothing else that can wash away our sin. So um, in a minute, we're going to sing a song, What Can Wash Away My Sin? Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. So We'll have a prayer, and then uh, if you want to sing along or you just want to listen to the song at the end, um, we'll invite you to do that as well. Thank you that you've given us your word, Father in heaven, that we can see of your great love, your patience, compassion, your grace. And we pray that as we continue, sometimes through difficulties and struggles, through temptation, through the power sometimes even that is seen in this world, help us to always remember that you are with us and that your power is greater, your wisdom is higher, and that you are the one who will lead us and guide us in the paths of righteousness, that we can live a life that honors and glorifies you, Help us to uh, realize that it's only through the power and the blood and the, 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 the death and crucifixion of Jesus Christ. That's where our sins are forgiven. 
And through his resurrection, we have that same power in our life, the spirit living within us, that we may live a life that reflects you and your holiness and your glory. We pray we can be people that uh, follow you and serve you and honor you because of love, because of your love for us, which changes us and increases our love for you. Help us that we may be faithful in our relationship just as you are faithful. Help us that we can continue to grow to love and trust and, and, and to, to be more like Jesus every day. So we thank you for grace and we thank you for life. We thank you for the promises and we thank you that you continue to work in our life through the powerful and mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.